My name is Zach Schaumler. This is my podcast, Strong Opinion Sports. It is my favorite thing in the entire world. And I, I want to... I want to ask for your help. I want this show to grow. I want more people to watch and more people to listen to this podcast. My dream is to do this show as my full-time job. I want to own it myself. I want to do it on the internet and have complete control. I don't want to do it for CBS or ESPN. I don't want to work for a big network. I want to own it myself. And if you believe in that dream, please do me a huge favor. Help me grow by telling your friends about this podcast. Share it on Facebook, share a link on Twitter. Maybe you screenshot it, put it on Instagram. I, I don't have a marketing strategy beyond this. This is all I have. You know, a lot of people, one of the most common comments I get on YouTube is, you have great content. We love your stuff. You deserve more viewers. What you should do is you should buy ad spaces on Facebook or Twitter or promote yourself and buy, buy revenue, like buy ads. I have no money. I am a broke college kid. I, I can't buy ad spaces. I, 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 don't have, I don't have money to pay for books. And so... My plan, this is my marketing plan, this is my strategy. All I plan to do is put every ounce of effort I have into making the very best podcast I can. I believe if I make a great product that people believe in, that people like, then they will share it with their friends. And so if you agree with that, if you believe in this show, if you like what I do, please do me a huge favor. Tell your friends about it. Help me grow by telling your friends about the show. I'm done. I feel like I use car sales and it feels gross. Uh, I, just, I just try to be honest with you guys. And as always, please... If you believe in what I do, help me grow by telling your friends about this podcast. Okay, three, two, one. Oh my goodness. Good morning, good afternoon. Whatever it is for you, I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Zach Schaumler. This is Strong Opinion Sports. Thank you so very much for tuning in. Today is Wednesday, February 20th, and... Uh, God dang, I'm so happy to be here. I've been wanting to do this show all dang day. It's been a long, stressful, annoying, painful day. Who cares? I don't know. I don't think college is for me, like, frankly. If I wasn't playing college football, there's no way I would ever be in college. I would have just dropped out um, after last semester. It's a, it's a me problem. I got to figure it out. I'm just not a fan of school. Uh, I got in trouble today. I was working on strong opinion sports quietly in the back, and a professor got mad at me. For not uh, not taking notes on the class, and I was like, "Well, the class is dumb, so I can't say that though." Um, I want to start with this. I want to start with Tom Brady. Tom Brady is hated by many, many people, and uh, honestly, I I don't get it. I don't understand. People look at Tom Brady; they see a rich guy with a supermodel wife, extremely successful. He's won six Super Bowls, and uh, they look at Tom Brady and they hate Tom Brady. They look at Tom Brady and go, "Ugh." The worst. I look at Tom Brady and I see someone inspirational. He inspires me. I love Tom Brady. I'm a big fan of Tom Brady. And uh, before, uh, by the way, before we go way too far down the rabbit hole, I'm gonna, I'm a nerd. I'm, I'm weird about all this stuff. I do want to say I'm gonna talk about the cheating scandals. I'm gonna talk about DeflateGate, all of that. Um, all I ask is please save your comments about it. Save your crap about deflate gate until after I've mentioned it. Like you can say you still don't agree with me. Please just at least wait until I address it to write really angry comments about it. That's, that's all I ask from you guys, please. Um, I, I do want to start with this though. Uh, traditionally in America, we love underdogs. We love someone who's overcome a ton of adversity and people conveniently forget Tom Brady is the ultimate underdog for whatever reason. I know it's, we're six Super Bowls in, but nobody seems to remember who Tom Brady was before he was, quote, Tom Brady. And uh, I, I think here's what's most funny to me. You got to mention this. Basically, everybody loves Peyton Manning. And yet we hate Tom Brady. And it makes no sense. It, I don't understand it. You look at history. And if you look at where Peyton Manning came from, his dad was an NFL quarterback. He came from a really rich family. He was a quarterback who started as a freshman at Tennessee at an SEC school. And then he became a number one overall pick. Some of them were earned, some of them were handed to him, but Peyton Manning had a lot of advantages. Advantages that Tom Brady never had. Now, credit Peyton Manning. He took advantage of them. He, he really used the things he was given, and he had a great career. He won two Super Bowls. Peyton Manning had a legendary NFL career. But Tom Brady did not have the same advantages that Peyton Manning had. He was just a guy. He was just a normal guy from San Mateo, California. 
In fact, he wasn't even the full-time starter his senior year in college at Michigan. All the advantages that Peyton Manning had, a guy we love, Tom Brady had none of those. People either forget or simply don't know the history of it. Tom Brady was a joke coming into the NFL. Nobody believed in Tom Brady. He was slow. They made fun of his footwork. He said he couldn't jump, said he couldn't run. He was a sixth-round draft pick at the end of the draft, an afterthought. Nobody wanted him. Didn't have a rich dad who played in the NFL. My point is Peyton Manning was given a lot of advantages. Had a great career. Well done. Fantastic. Tom Brady had none of those advantages, and he won up to Peyton Manning. He was better than Peyton Manning. He's won six Super Bowls. He's still playing. Peyton Manning's out of the league. He's done. And it's, it's weird to me how we love an underdog up to a point. But once the underdog starts succeeding too much, it's like we forget about the underdog and no, no, matter, no longer care. And, and maybe that's the best compliment to Tom Brady is that he's won so much we all forget where he came from. But the guy came from nothing. That's what's weird to me. The guy was a backup. Tom Brady was buried on the depth chart. He was a fourth string NFL quarterback. Then he committed his entire life to football and became the Tom Brady we know today. And it's, it's, a lot of people think they work hard. A lot of people think they work extremely hard. Uh, but I want to ask you, have you ever done one thing for your entire day, every single day of your life? I know I haven't. I've done, I've done a lot of work. I've never done what Tom Brady does. It's amazing. It's so weird to me we don't look to Tom Brady as an inspirational figure. We look to Tom Brady as someone to hate. And I just don't understand it. He's the best in his field. He's extremely, extremely successful. Look, I'm not, but if, if I could be, oh, I would love to be the Tom Brady of sports broadcasting. Hell yeah, that'd be awesome. That'd be the, you want to be the best in your field. Isn't that the goal? Isn't that what we all want? If you're selling car insurance, you're a real estate agent, you're a doctor, you're an engineer, you're an analyst. Don't we all look up to the people who are the best in our field? Maybe we don't. Maybe, maybe you don't want to be the best in your field. I, I would love to be the best in my field. I don't know. Maybe you hate your job and you're jealous of the fact that Tom Brady loves his job. He loves what he does every single day. But the only reason to hate Tom Brady is because you're jealous of him. This is what I don't understand. Tom Brady's been so successful. Again, rich, seems like his wife, been incredibly successful, won six Super Bowls. Isn't that what everybody wants? I just don't understand the jealousy or the hatred. He's an example of an underdog, a guy who came from nothing. Let's repeat again. He did it so well, we all forgot Tom Brady was ever an underdog. He entered the NFL draft, sixth-round draft pick. Nobody wanted him. Nobody believes in him. Nobody believed in Tom Brady going into the NFL. Have you ever, you ever felt that way? Like nobody believes in you? That's what I find cool. It's a guy who overcame that. And not only overcame it and succeeded a little bit, he became the greatest of all time. I think that's cool. I, I, I don't hate Tom Brady. I think he's an inspirational figure. I don't understand why more people don't see him that way. Um, if nothing else, you got to be impressed. Like, what kind of person wakes up after... You've won four Super Bowls. You have won four. More than almost anybody ever. After winning four Super Bowls, what person wakes up in the morning and goes, I want more. I want to keep getting more. Years and years and years, all day of dedication, and people don't seem to understand how much time it takes. Nobody seems to appreciate the guy. Um, I don't know. Some people don't hate Tom Brady because of the fact he wins all the time. Some people call Tom Brady a cheater. We'll address this. I think it's important. Uh, they're referencing deflate gate. What happened was the Patriots and Tom Brady got in trouble for using slightly underinflated footballs. I mean, like a tiny amount, a few PSI. You could squish the ball just a little bit when you grabbed it. And in the 2016 NFL season, Tom Brady was suspended for the first four games of the year. Now, the NFL never proved that he knew about it. They just, they, they fined him, they penalized him. But what we do know is that Tom Brady destroyed his cell phone, so he tried to hide evidence. And look, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I played quarterback my entire life. I, I, I know this. If the balls were underinflated, he knew it, right? He knew about it. There's no way he didn't know about it. But also, after playing football my entire life, I know that's not that much of an advantage. We, we're acting like a few PSI is this great advantage, and that's why Tom Brady won a bunch of Super Bowls. He's a cheater. 
He, he took an advantage that other people didn't have. It's not that big a deal. It was never that big a deal. It's really what it is more is, is slightly comfortable. It's, it's a little bit of comfort rather than a true tactical advantage. I don't know. I, people, some, a lot of people did tests. A lot of YouTubers did stuff like this, and they said, well, a, a underinflated football is easier to throw. It's easier to catch an underinflated football. I actually disagree. Um, I, personally, like we throw at the football field, and I will admit most quarterbacks I throw with like the ball slightly underinflated. I like the full thing all the way pumped up. I think it spins off your hand a little better that way. Uh, but look, here's the point. If you want to call Tom Brady a cheater, go ahead. It's fine. It's a free country. Do whatever you want. I think it's silly. You know, un if you're mad about underinflated footballs, you realize a, a ball with a few less PSI doesn't read the defense. He doesn't throw the ball to the right spot. He doesn't have accuracy. I don't know. An underinflated football is not the guy, the brain, operating Tom Brady's arm. So if you hate Tom Brady for a couple underinflated footballs, I think you miss the point. You miss out on a wonderfully inspirational model of success to me. Um, I, it seems like a lot of people are jealous. It seems like Deflategate gives them something legitimate to hang on to and be really angry about. But uh, I, I will say Deflategate never changed the outcome of games. Deflategate was not a big enough of a, a deal to impact the outcome, the final score of football games. Like, I, I bring this all up. I'm not trying to convince anybody. I just, I, I, I went home this weekend, and a lot of people were like, you like Tom Brady? And there were, there, a lot of people hate him, apparently. And I just don't understand. I don't understand why everybody hates the guy. You know, a lot of people say, well, Peyton Manning is relatable, and Tom Brady's not relatable. They, they see Peyton Manning in all state commercials or doing, you know, Papa Murphy's, Papa Murphy's pizza commercials. And a guy in a commercial is never relatable to me. He's an actor. And if you really learn the story of who Tom Brady is, he's not only the ultimate underdog, he's one of the most relatable athletes of all time because he's a guy who came from nothing, who nobody believed him and nobody wanted him. Again, I repeat, haven't you ever felt that way? How can you not relate to that? That guy that nobody believed him turned himself into the best ever, ever. That to me, Peyton Manning was the number one overall pick with a rich dad who played in the NFL. Tom Brady overcame the odds and built himself into the greatest football player of all time. If not, at least, the, at least you can admit the greatest quarterback of all time. And I find that incredibly inspiring. I think that's incredible. So hate him if you want. I fundamentally do not understand why someone would hate Tom Brady rather than choose to look at him as an example of success and try to model your life after the way he's carried himself. I think it's really cool. I think Tom Brady's inspirational. I will say, you know, what I, another thing I like about Tom Brady, he doesn't try to be relatable. He doesn't try to be likable. He just does his thing. What Tom Brady loves is winning football games. And that, that's cool to me. He just does what he loves. And look, there's nothing wrong with being a fan of Peyton Manning. If you like Peyton Manning, that's amazing. I, I loved Peyton Manning growing up. I had a poster of Peyton Manning on the wall. He had like three movements, and that's how I learned how to throw a football, was watching Peyton Manning on my poster, putting it together. Oh, split, check, flick the finger off your nose, like, or off your, the booger off your finger. That's literally what the poster said. I learned how to throw a football because of, Tom, of Peyton Manning. But it's weird to me to love Peyton Manning, who's not the best and who had a bunch of advantages Tom Brady didn't. It's weird to me to love Peyton Manning, but hate Tom Brady. That's jealousy. And, and that's something I, I don't understand why anyone is jealous of a professional athlete who you're never going to compete against in your entire life. I don't get it. Um, I think it's very weird people hate Tom Brady. Okay, we have a great show today. We're going to talk about the Alliance of American Football Week 3. We're going to do... Uh, we're also going to talk about some of the financial problems that the Alliance of American Football has had recently. We'll talk about quarterbacks. Um, we're going to talk about the top three college quarterbacks of all time, in my opinion, my favorite three. We'll talk about three college quarterbacks I cannot wait to watch next season in 2019. We'll talk about the Manny Machado contract. And we're also going to talk about um, a quarterback named Luis Perez, who is just a really, really cool story, a guy I'm a big fan of, and... Uh, quite possibly the greatest quarterback, or the best quarterback right now in the NFL Developmental League, the Alliance of American Football. Uh, before we move on, I want to say this. I, I need your help. 
please subscribe to Strong Opinion Sports on iTunes, on SoundCloud, on YouTube, whatever it is. If you're listening, I'm sure you, you if you're listening to the full podcast, you know this, right? I just my spiel every time. What I want you to do, please help me grow by telling your friends about this podcast. Uh, I might even play this at the beginning of the show, so I really hit it home. I don't have a marketing strategy at all. I, I can't afford to do Facebook ads. A lot of people comment like, why don't you do Facebook ads? You deserve more viewers and you should do this and that. And they have a lot of ideas for me. One, I, I don't have the ability. I can barely also find the time to do this podcast. I don't have the time to develop a lot of ads and do sponsorships. And all. I, 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 don't have, I, I don't have the time to do that. My belief and my plan for building strong opinion sports is to just keep making the very best podcast that I can. I'm a, I'm a student athlete. I'm in college full time. I have a job and I have a podcast. It's a lot. It's a, it's a ton. And so I just think if I focus all my energy on making the very best podcast with the best content I possibly can, it will grow through word of mouth. That's my hope. My hope is you guys love it so much that you tell your friends about it and help me grow. Because I, I want to grow. Like, I want to get to bigger numbers. We're doing well. It's, I'm, we're ahead of schedule. We're better than I thought we'd be doing. Um, but I just wanted to communicate to you guys. Please help me. I want to do strong opinion sports as my full-time job someday when I'm done. And I would rather do it on my own than do it through a, a network. I don't want to work for ESPN. I'd rather not work for CBS. I want to own it myself so I can have the freedom to say whatever I want. I've been offered radio jobs, and I, I don't want to take them. I want to do it this way with you guys and on the internet, on YouTube, on SoundCloud, on iTunes, and own it myself. And so please help me do that by telling your friends about this show. Okay, I'm done. I feel weird. I feel like a used car salesman. I, don't, I hate promoting myself. It's so bizarre. Um, you know, people make fun of me. They're like, well, you love your show. You're so proud of it. Why don't you promote it? And, and I, I just, ugh, I've had a lot of co- creators, like they'll DM me on, on Facebook or on Instagram or Twitter. And they're like, and I don't even use Twitter anymore, but they'd be like, Hey, check out my video. And I'm like, ah, da, da, da. look, it's different. If you send me something and you're another sports creator, that's cool, I guess. But for the most part, I, I don't want to shove my content down other people's throats. But if you guys do it, if you tell your friends, that's helpful. Okay, let's move on. Let's we're done. <laughs> the curtain's done. We're, we're done talking about that. I want to talk about Manny Machado. So Major League Baseball free agent Manny Machado has signed a massive, massive contract with the San Diego Padres. It's a 10-year deal worth $300 million. Yes, he's getting paid more than the investor just invested in the Alliance of American Football the other day. Uh, now, it, it's also worth noting in the past, Manny Machado has played both shortstop and third base. He's probably going to play third base for the San Diego Padres because one of their best upcoming prospects is a uh, shortstop. So we're expecting Manny Machado is going to play third base. And I just want to say, frankly, nobody should care about this move. I Maybe if you're a Padres fan, amazing. I personally could not care less about the fact that Manny Machado signed with the San Diego Padres. He's a, he's a great player. He's a fantastic, wonderful baseball player. But the Padres were 66 and 96 last season. 66 wins, 96 losses. They were last in the NL West. Manny Machado is a great baseball player. He batted 297 last year. Um, I would sign him in a heartbeat. His antics don't bother me. I like the fact he's got a personality on and off the field. But I wish, I so badly wish... Manny Machado was going to an actual contender. I wish he was going to a good team that had a chance to win their division. His talent is going to be wasted. No offense, San Diego, but his talent's going to be wasted with the San Diego Padres. It's sad to me, the baseball fan who wants to watch good baseball and wants to watch drama. I go, ah, dang it. It's like when Robinson Cano went to the Mariners or Alex Rodriguez goes to the Texas Rangers, they're not going to have a big enough impact. It's like, ah, dang it. I get it. I I understand why Padres fans are going to San Diego next weekend. I understand why Padres fans are so excited. Their team is a little bit better. That's cool. But ah, man, I just, I don't, I don't care. Some people are saying, you know, the Padres have 10 of the best 100 prospects coming up in the minor leagues. Uh, I want to tell you right now, this is not even a prediction. This is a, a fact. Manny Machado will not turn around the San Diego Padres. Maybe they make other moves down the road, but Manny Machado will not be 
the tipping point. He's not the straw that broke the camel's back, the, the what do you call it, the things that fall, the domino that's tipped the point. It's none of that. Manny Machado will not be a turning point for the San Diego Padres. He's a really good player who is going to be wasting years of his career in a really nice town to live. But the Padres' problems are really deep and really extensive. They need pitching. They need players. They need better batters. Got a great player. That's awesome. It doesn't matter. If you took an old, decrepit house, a, a, it's been abandoned for 20 years. The paint's messed up. There's holes in the floor. There's holes in the walls. The roof is leaking. If you take that really awful old house and you make the bathroom look really, really nice, you spend a ton of money, do a really expensive remodel, but only on the bathroom, the house still sucks. You have a nice bathroom? That's great. You spent a lot of money. I'm glad your bathroom's awesome. But your house is still trash. And that is San Diego Padres in a nutshell. They're still a bad team. They got a great expensive player. Congratulations. But even with Manny Machado, the Padres are still bad. And, and I'm really sad. I, I'm very disappointed. I wish that Manny Machado had gone to a contender. I was so excited when he got traded to the L.A. Dodgers last year. I was like, yes, it makes it interesting. It's fun. He's on a contender. He can have an impact with his play. I'm just, I'm, I, I looked at the trade news and I went, oh, and I barely care about baseball. Like I'm not a huge, I like baseball a lot. I love, I love, passionately love playoff baseball, but I don't normally pay attention to all the signings and the free agency stuff in baseball. Uh, and I saw that trade news. I was very excited to see where he goes. And I saw that and was like, hmm, the Padres. Dang it. It's, it's just disappointing to me. And if you're a baseball fan, you might feel the same way. Let's talk about the Alliance of American Football. Very briefly, we'll talk about that, and then we'll move somewhere else, and then we'll come back to the Alliance at the end of the show. Does that make sense? So quarterback story, other stuff, then we'll talk about week two of the Alliance of American Football down the road. Luis Perez is the quarterback for the Birmingham Iron. And he has a wonderful, wonderful story. I want to share it with you guys. Currently, right now, he's playing in the Alliance of American Football. He is trying to move up and get to the NFL. He's a quarterback. He's great. And I think, really, he's one of the best quarterbacks in the Alliance of American Football. But here is why he is not only so interesting. His story is just really, really cool, a, a fascinating one, and one that makes you want to root for him. Luis Perez never played quarterback in high school. Never. Never once did Luis Perez take a snap or play on a football field at quarterback in high school. In fact, his senior year, there's a quote uh, in an ESPN article. He's talking about watching his friends play his senior year from the side, from the, like the bleachers. Wasn't even on the sidelines as a backup. He literally didn't play football his senior year of high school. He played JV tight end for a little bit, then didn't play. But here's where it gets really fascinating. He, he didn't play quarterback in high school at all, didn't play football his senior year, and then he walked onto a junior college, Southwest Junior College in California. Started as the ninth string quarterback. Buried. Nobody wants this guy. His quarterback, his coaches even were like, we, we really don't want you. Like, you're here, we'll take, you, we'll take your body, but dude, you're not going to get any reps. And he stuck with it. He stuck with it. He kept working. He stayed around. And everybody around him changed. Some guys transferred. Some guys got hurt. Other people, some switched positions completely. And then he found himself in the mix as like the fourth string quarterback. And eventually, by his second season in junior college, Luis Perez found himself starting as a quarterback in college. Never played in high school. Found himself starting for a junior college in California, which is not an easy task, by the way. It's very competitive to go to a junior college and play quarterback. From junior college, he went to Texas A&M Commerce, a, a small Division II school, a powerhouse in Division II right now, but a Division II college football team. The guy who never once played high school quarterback won not only a, the 2017 National Championship in Division II, he also won the Division II version of the Heisman Trophy. He was named the best Division II football player of 2017. The guy that never once played high school football. I'm, I'm beating you over the head with it, but it's amazing to me. I go, oh, oh my goodness. 
And it gets even cooler from there. Then in 2018, he Division II quarterbacks rarely ever have a chance to play professional football. Well, he did. He went on, in 2018, last year, in the preseason, he spent the preseason with the L.A. Rams, and Sean McVay, the Rams head coach, credited him for, beat, for Luis Perez. He said Luis Perez would beat him. The Rams head coach, Luis Perez, would beat the head coach into the facility every single day because he was so driven. And it shows, as if it wasn't clear already, Luis Perez is incredibly, incredibly driven. The guy wants to succeed as a quarterback. I'm rooting for him. It's such a cool story. A guy who's persevered, who didn't, he played, he went to a wing T high school, which means it's a running offense. They never throw the ball. They put him at tight end. He quit football, but he said, I want to play quarterback. He walked onto a junior college, hung around, stayed with it, stayed with it, fought hard and fought and fought and got himself a chance, became the starter. Then he won a national championship. Then he won the division two Heisman trophy. And now he's a professional quarterback trying to make it to the NFL. And not only is he trying to make it, he probably will. He's playing this year with the Birmingham Iron. He's likely, him or Garrett Gilbert are the two best quarterbacks in the Alliance of American Football. And I believe he will move on and up to the NFL. Luis Perez, his story is incredible. I'm rooting for you. I I think your story is so cool. And I just cannot wait to see how things unfold. Okay. Uh, More quarterbacks. Today's all about quarterbacks. I'm sorry. Um, it's, it's my passion. It's, uh, I had a hard week and, and this is for me as like comfort food, just writing about quarterbacks and writing about stuff and sharing my opinions. So I, uh, I want to do something. Instagram just had a, a thing where you share your top three, you know, top three blank and in movies. And a lot of people, what people ask me predominantly were football questions. Cause I guess a lot of people that follow me know I like sports. <laughs> and uh, one of the questions came up, I said, who are your three favorite college quarterbacks of all time? So again, someone recently asked me, who are your favorite three college football quarterbacks of all time? My three favorite college football quarterbacks of all time start with Jalen Hurts. Jalen Hurts' story is unbelievable. He just transferred from Alabama to Oklahoma. Still got one year left to play college football. And it doesn't matter. I want to say this. It doesn't matter how Jalen Hurts plays or even if Jalen Hurts plays. If Jalen Hurts gets hurt or gets beat out, it doesn't matter. His legacy is cemented forever. And I will always, always admire Jalen Hurts. Jalen Hurts' legacy is the character he showed at the University of Alabama. His freshman year of college, he was a starting quarterback. He led his team to the national championship. They lost to Clemson. Then he did it again. His sophomore year, he led Alabama again for the second year in a row to the national championship. And in the national championship, the middle of the, seat, middle of the game at halftime, Jalen Hurts got benched. That, that's got to be heartbreaking. That hurts your ego tremendously, getting benched. I've been benched. It is not fun. And then his third year rolls around, his junior year in college, his third year of eligibility in college. And Jalen Hurts could have transferred. We're going into the season, and Tua just dominated the national championship. They won the national championship. They beat Georgia. And the Jalen Hurts was benched. The backup quarterback, Tua Tungavaloa, came in and was fantastic. And so now all offseason leading into the third year of Jalen Hurts' career, you have, is he going to transfer or is he going to stay? And honestly, a lot of us looked around and said, Jalen Hurts is not going to be the starting quarterback at Alabama. He's going to lose this battle. And he did. He lost the quarterback battle. He was made to be the backup quarterback. The guy who led his team to the national championship two years in a row was now a backup. And he stayed and fought. He stayed and fought, and he did it with class. He had a great attitude the entire time, was friendly, got along with the backup, with the starting quarterback. He had a good attitude. And it is hard to have a good attitude when you get benched. And what's even cooler is the end of the story is that when Jalen Hurts' team needed him his junior year, his third year in college football, we're in the SEC championship game. Again, Alabama was playing Georgia. And the starting quarterback was struggling. They put in Jalen Hurts. I think he got hurt. I think Tua actually got hurt. But they put in Jalen Hurts. He scored two touchdowns and led Alabama to a comeback victory to beat Georgia and get into the college football playoff, to remain undefeated and stay the number one team in the country at the time. 
That's so cool. What more do you want? So look, he left Alabama. He's going to go play at Oklahoma for his final season. I can't blame him, but for me, it's not about his play on the field. It's the person he was when his team needed him. He never had a bad attitude. He never quit. He was there when they needed him in the SEC championship game. The way, the class that Jalen Hurts showed when he was benched, when he wasn't the starter, is why he is my favorite college quarterback of all time. I love the guy. I'm loyal to the guy. I think it is so cool. How about my second quarterback? Who is my second favorite quarterback of all time in college football? It's Gardner Minshew. Gardner Minshew, the former Washington State quarterback. I love the guy. I, I thoroughly, I've met him. I shook his hand. He's very nice. I love him wholeheartedly. He's my favorite quarterback uh, other than Jalen Hurts ever in college football. He was a graduate transfer, which means that he had, he was leaving another school to go to Washington State. And nobody believed in him to succeed. Nobody thought Gardner Minshew was going to succeed at Washington State. And then he killed it. Then he dominated in that offense. He was second in the nation in passing. Won like a bunch of awards, won a bunch of like the Dave O'Brien Award or something. It was, it's really cool. But it's not just the fact that he succeeded. It's the way he succeeded. The way he did it. So he's a, he was a graduate transfer, meaning that his former college East Carolina did not want him. And then he had to go to, he went to Washington State for his final season of college football. But here's the even cooler hitch. He was planning to go to Alabama. He was going to be the backup quarterback at Alabama. He, he was going to hang it up. He's done. He's like, I'm going to retire. I'll be a coach. I can go to Alabama for my final year, be a backup. Maybe someone gets hurt, so I'll be ready if they need me. And then Washington State called him. The only reason why he went to Washington State was because something happened and they needed a quarterback immediately. So Gardner Minshew gets to Washington State. He has one year of college football left. And he just has fun with it. He plays great. He's good natured. The way he carried himself was really inspiring. He had like a mustache and was just loose, just having fun. It's the way he succeeded. It's not that he succeeded. It's the way he did it. His attitude. I loved his attitude, but it's not just his attitude. He's not a overwhelmingly physically dominant quarterback. He's not 6'5". He has a very weak arm in, by NFL standards. But the reason why Gardner Minshew succeeded was because he knew the game so well. He understood concepts. He knew how to read a defense. He had great footwork. He did the little things right. That, to me, is so cool and so inspiring. He knew where to put the ball in the right spot every single time. Look, I play college quarterback, and I hope to play like Gardner Minshew. I have an average arm, but the way Gardner Minshew knew the game really well, he, he made up for his limitations with a deep understanding of football. He was good-natured. He just had fun with it. That, to me, that is so inspiring. That, that's why Gardner Minshew is my second favorite quarterback of all time in college football. The way he carried himself, the fact he succeeded when no one believed in him, and the way he did it, with physical limitations, didn't hold him back. He understood the offense, he understood defenses, and he made up for his physical limitations with a great understanding of how the game of football works. And actually, look, I, I, I'm 21. I just transferred colleges. I, uh, I transferred to go play college football again. And all three of these quarterbacks inspired that decision. Jalen Hurts, Gardner Minshew, the way he carried himself, the way he had fun. I hope to be like that. I aspire to be a guy who's loose and just enjoys the experience. But the third quarterback who influenced that decision, and, and my third favorite quarterback of all time, is Baker Mayfield, quarterback from Oklahoma. I remember when Baker Mayfield walked on at Texas Tech, and I looked at that, and I was so jealous. <laughs> I was like, man, I want to do that. I want to go play college football and be successful. And if you know the story about Baker Mayfield, he walked on to Texas Tech as a true freshman. He was 18 years old, and he broke a ton of Big 12 record, like freshman passing records. And then he got hurt. And after really, after killing it at Texas Tech for part of his freshman year, he was a starting quarterback at the week one, a true freshman walk-on starting quarterback at Texas Tech. He got hurt. And there was a bunch of confusion about what happens next, but long story short is Baker Mayfield did not get the scholarship he wanted. He didn't get a scholarship. So he left. Baker Mayfield walked away. 
He left Texas Tech and walked on again for a second time. He walked on to Oklahoma. This is now the second college Baker Mayfield had walked on to. That is already unbelievable. To make it twice? But then he, he kicked butt. He led his team to the college football playoff. He won the Heisman Trophy. Not to mention, Baker Mayfield's a small guy. He's not a guy a lot of people believe in. But he has a huge arm because of his perfect mechanics. He does the little things right. And I love his personality. I love who Baker Mayfield is. Baker Mayfield, a lot of people don't like him. A lot of people do not like the way he carries himself. He doesn't care. He's like Braveheart. He just does his thing. People follow him into battle. And I, I love the way Baker Mayfield carries himself. All three of these quarterbacks have inspired me. Baker Mayfield, the guy who said, I'm willing to take a chance. No one wants me. Screw it. I believe in myself. I'll go for it. Gardner Minshew, the way he had fun. He was loose. He had a good time. He enjoyed the experience. That's really cool to me. And then Jalen Hurts, the way that Jalen Hurts handled adversity. He got benched. It's embarrassing. National television. That's humiliating. And he handled it well. He didn't get mad. Didn't freak out. Didn't quit. Kept his head up. Stayed the course. And really, really did good things for his football program because of it. Those are my three favorite college football quarterbacks of all time. Jalen Hurts, Gardner Minshew, and Baker Mayfield. They are fantastic. Um, I want to now move on to Kyler Murray. Drink some water first. My mouth, I get more lispy the less water I drink. So as my mouth gets drier, it makes more spit to make up for it. I'm really sorry. Like, I have a lisp. I'm sorry. I, I have a bad broadcasting voice. Like, let's be real. I've always felt very insecure about the way I talk. And uh, my, my kind of philosophy is, okay, well, I have a bad broadcasting voice. It's okay. I own it. And uh, I try to say something interesting every single time I talk. I, I script out my show, not completely heavily, but I do, like, I'm very careful about the words I say. I take my time. I try to slow down. Um, <laughs> but I think if I say something valuable or important every time I talk, that makes up for my limitations. I have a buddy of mine who has, like, a golden voice. He does political radio. He, he's he's a really, really a, a great broadcaster. Um, he has this voice, though. He does voiceovers. And he the guy could say Hershey Bar, like Hershey Bar, Hershey Bar, Hershey Bar. He could say Hershey Bar for like three hours. See, I can't do it. But he has this incredible voice. He could talk for like three hours. And you could just say Hershey Bar the whole time. And it, you don't care. It just sounds so beautiful. He's got a golden voice. And for me, I, I know I don't have that. So I, I try to say something interesting and valuable every single time I talk. Let's talk about Kyler Murray. Kyler Murray is a quarterback entering the 2019 NFL draft. And uh, there's speculation he could be a first round draft pick. And what that does is many, many people are leading themselves to, com they are comparing Kyler Murray to Baker Mayfield. And the comparison makes sense. I understand why people are making this comparison. Here's why it's interesting. So in 2017, Baker Mayfield was a short Oklahoma quarterback who lit it up, who dominated, and won the Heisman Trophy. And then the very next year in 2018, this time it was Kyler Murray who was the short Oklahoma quarterback who tore it up and won, and won the Heisman Trophy. And by the way, both of them led their teams to the college football playoff. They're both really small for quarterbacks. Kyler Murray is 5'10", maybe 5'9". Baker Mayfield, 6 foot, maybe 6'1". They also had really, really similar stats their final season in Oklahoma. In 2017, Baker Mayfield had 43 touchdowns, 6 interceptions, 4,627 yards with a 70% completion percentage. Now in 2018, similarly, Kyler Murray had 42 touchdowns. Baker had 43. Kyler had only seven interceptions. Baker had six. Kyler had 4,361 yards. Baker had about 300 more. And when Baker had a 70% completion percentage, Kyler Murray's completion percentage was 69%. They are nearly identical. Not to mention the fact that Baker Mayfield could not run as well as Kyler Murray. So Kyler Murray was a better athlete who ran the ball better for more touchdowns and more yards than Baker Mayfield. Now, here's the problem, and it's going to shock you. You may not believe me when I say this, but believe it or not, 
Kyler Murray <laughs> is not Baker Mayfield. I know, I know, it's crazy. I had to, oh, I had to, I had to call a lot of people and do some counseling about it. Uh, the biggest difference between Kyler Murray and Baker Mayfield is their personalities. You can compare their stats all you want. You can talk about the way they throw the ball, all this stuff, but when it comes down to it, Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray are very different personalities. Look, I'm a big fan of Kyler Murray. I hope he succeeds. I think he could succeed. I want to watch more film and understand his decision-making process before I'm ready to say, I'm doing a podcast down the road. I'll say, I want to do a, a definitive, a lot of research and really say, is, big, is Kyler Murray, could he be a successful NFL quarterback? Would I draft him in the first round? I'm not there yet. I haven't done the research yet. But we can all admit, look, I like him. He's, got a, he's interesting. I love his play. I like that he's short. I root for short quarterbacks. And he killed it in college. He's way better than Daniel Jones, Drew Locke, guys like that. But when you make a comparison, when you make comparisons between Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray, you got to remember how special of a personality Baker Mayfield has. Baker Mayfield's not every other dude. He is the guy who said, I want to go to Cleveland. I want to go be the starting quarterback for the Cleveland Browns, take on a horrific, horrific, tumultuous history with, of a franchise and say, I want to take that on. And I want to be the guy to turn that around. There's not a lot of people who say, I want to go to Cleveland. So compare Kyler Murray and Baker Mayfield all you want. Compare their stats, their height, their ability. But it's not entirely fair to compare Kyler Murray to Baker Mayfield. I don't know that you can compare anybody to Baker Mayfield because he deserves some credit. Baker Mayfield, his personality, the who he is, is just incredibly rare. And so, again, compare Kyler Murray all you want, but he is not the person that Baker Mayfield is. And Baker Mayfield is a very special, incredibly talented, incredibly driven person. I, I don't know that Kyler, may, maybe he is, but I know we all saw in college, Baker Mayfield was had a special personality. I can't say I saw that from Kyler Murray. I saw a guy who looked really nervous on the podium. I saw a guy who had a very weird interview with Dan Patrick. And they're, they're not the same personality. And so, and so that's my hesitation when you compare Kyler Murray and Baker Mayfield. They have very different personalities. Okay. Um, there are three quarterbacks I cannot wait to watch in 2019. I'm so excited. Uh, and I will say, if your quarterback is not on the list, please do not take it personally. I mean, no offense um, I was driving around with my uh, my girl <laughs> last weekend, and uh, we were going to the beach. And on the way to the beach, I realized I was just sitting there just like daydreaming. I was so excited to watch these three quarterbacks. Uh, I'm not going to name Trevor Lawrence or Tua Tungavaloa. They're not on the list. It's not that I'm not excited about them. It's just we all know Trevor Lawrence is going to kill it. Tua Tungavaloa is going to have a great season. What about the other people? The unknown. The next three quarterbacks I'm going to list – it's the unknown that makes them interesting. Will they succeed or will they not? Why would that happen? The, the intrigue and the curiosity I have is why these three quarterbacks are the quarterbacks I am most excited to watch in 2019. The first quarterback is Jalen Hurts, the quarterback at Oklahoma. He's a graduate transfer. He got beat out by Tua Tungvaloa at Alabama last year. So Jalen Hurts left Alabama. He transferred away. And... Uh, I think the story here is this, is that his freshman year of college, Jalen Hurts lost the national championship to Deshaun Watson and Clemson. And when they lost the national championship, the weakness of Clemson, no, the weakness of Alabama, excuse me, Alabama's weakness was their starting quarterback wasn't very good. Jalen Hurts, their quarterback, had a really, really limited ability to throw the football. Then he got benched. He, got, he didn't play much all year. He got benched. Tua beat him out. And we didn't see Jalen Hurts again until the 2018. So 2016 was his first year, was rough. 2017 was rough, but he played all year. 2017, he got beat out by Tua. Tua was the starting quarterback all through 2018. The last time we saw Jalen Hurts, and the first time we really saw him in a meaningful game, was in 2018 in the SEC Championship game between Alabama and Georgia. And what we saw was a, a different version of Jalen Hurts, a guy who is really, really improved. 
in the final quarter of the SEC, SEC championship game, Jalen Hurts was 7 for 9, had 82 yards passing, two touchdowns, and he led a come-from-behind victory over Georgia. So the question we have, the reason why I'm intrigued to watch Jalen Hurts this year is, what kind of quarterback are we getting from Jalen Hurts? Are we getting the guy who wasn't that great at Alabama his first couple of years? Or are we getting the improved version of Jalen Hurts that we saw in the SEC championship game this year? Did he improve? So he sat on the bench for a whole year, watched a lot of film. I think he played against Tua, who's an incredibly gifted quarterback. I have no doubt that competition probably elevated the play of Jalen Hurts. Is it possible? I think it is that Jalen Hurts is going to be much improved. He's got a great head coach, Lincoln Riley, at Oklahoma. He's got a year of battling against a really good quarterback, and he's got a year of sitting and learning and watching a bunch of film. I think it is not only possible, very likely. Jalen Hurts has a wonderfully fantastic year and dominates at Oklahoma, and that is what I'm curious to see. Now, maybe he gets beat out. Maybe Spencer Rattler, the freshman quarterback, comes in and just beats him out. I think that's unlikely. And I cannot wait to watch Jalen Hurts in 2019. The next quarterback I can't wait to watch is Jacob Eason, the quarterback from the University of Washington. Uh, He's got another cool story. This is a guy who started in the SEC. His true freshman season, he was a starting quarterback at Georgia. That's unheard of. (laughs) You're the starting quarterback at a big-time SEC, and not even like a Kentucky, at Georgia. You're the starting quarterback as a true freshman at Georgia. And at the beginning of his sophomore year, uh, Jacob Eason got hurt. And that's when Jake Frum, the backup quarterback, came in. And even though Jacob Eason was a better quarterback, Georgia got on a winning streak. Their roster was incredible. Jake Frum was playing pretty well. And they said, well, we're winning. We're not going to screw this up. We're going to stick with Jake Frum the whole year. And so even though, in my opinion, Jacob Eason was a better quarterback than Jake Frum, Georgia stuck with their guy. And that led Jacob Eason to transfer. He said, I'm going to leave Georgia. I'm going to go transfer to University of Washington. I think it's very, very likely. Jacob Eason, a guy who started as a true freshman at Georgia, a guy who, if you watch the way Jacob Eason throws the football, he has a special amount of arm strength. He's different. Watch him in high school. It's just the ball comes out of his hand differently than any guy I've seen in a long time. He's like a, a Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen level of arm strength. He's different. And I think Jacob Eason is very likely to dominate the Pac-12 next season. I cannot wait to watch what happens and how that unfolds. The final quarterback I am really, really excited to watch is a guy entering his second year in college. His name is JT Daniels. He is the quarterback at USC. And uh, last year, he struggled. He he wasn't awful, but he had 14 touchdowns, 10 interceptions, and a 59% completion percentage. But USC got a new offensive coordinator. USC's new offensive coordinator is Graham Harrell, a former Texas Tech quarterback, a guy who played for Mike Leach back in the day. What that means is he has a lot of very intricate, very complex passing schemes in his brain. By the way, Graham Harrell is fourth all-time in Division I passing yards. So my assumption is that Graham Harrell's offense is going to open up USC's passing game, very similar to what Graham Harrell did at his former school, North Texas University. North Texas loved him. They wanted to keep him. The truth is, financially, they could not keep up with USC. They were prepared to give him a $3,000 raise, and USC was like, we have millions of dollars, so we'll take you. And uh, I I cannot wait to see what happens. Again, in in JT Daniels' true freshman season, he he wasn't great. He struggled. And, And I was willing to say, look, he's got a bad offensive system. I don't really know that his coaching's great. And he's a true freshman. He's a young kid. This year is the year to see what happens. A really good coach. He's got a year of experience under his belt. I cannot wait to see if and how JT Daniels develops next year at USC. Okay, Uh, we have, we're going to talk about the AAF a little bit. And then we're going to talk about, yeah, we're going to talk. So what we're going to do next, we're going to talk about week three of the Alliance of American Football. And then we're going to end the show by talking about a really horrifying, scary news story I saw out of the Alliance of American Football this week. So we will start with this. Week three of the Alliance of American Football has just ended. What I'm going to do is, is, excuse me, whoa, week three. 
not not true at all. It's week two. Uh, week two. <laughs> I see the voice crack. We got to we got to reset. We got to do it again. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave this in, but it's it's embarrassing when your voice goes. <laughs> Week two of the Alliance of American Football has ended, and what I want to do is run through everything that happened and offer a little bit of analysis for every single game. So we'll go through first. The first game I want to talk about is the Birmingham Iron beat the Salt Lake Stallions twelve to nine. And what's interesting is the final score was about what I expected it to be. I thought it'd be a close game between two. Fairly solid rosters. What's surprising to me is the way that things played out. I thought Birmingham was the better team all the way, and they would have the lead, and Salt Lake would come up just short. Really, the truth is Salt Lake should have won the game. They had a lead 9-0 to in the fourth quarter, and they just had a meltdown at the very end and lost the game. The Stallions lost because they had multiple. Salt Lake lost because they had multiple missed opportunities. They had a field goal attempt that went badly because of a drop snap. So that's one field goal they could have had they lost. They also missed a field goal later in the game. So that's two field goals that were botched. And then at the very end of the game, they dropped a punt, which led to a Birmingham touchdown. Salt Lake allowed Birmingham, the iron, to get back in the game. They gave him a chance. Birmingham took advantage of that. And you got to remember, the Birmingham Iron have the best quarterback in the entire Alliance of American football. At the end of the fourth quarter, Luis Perez, the Birmingham Irons quarterback, led an 11-play drive that gave them the lead and ultimately gave the Birmingham Iron the win. It's a, it's a, I think the way the Birmingham Iron play is very, very indicative and very, ironically, it makes sense with their name. They pound the ball. They're very similar to the way the Patriots won games this year. They play good defense, they pound the ball inside, running the football, and they have a really, really well, really, really good quarterback, Luis Perez, who just takes care of the ball. He's not flashy, he's not exciting to watch, but he puts the ball in the right spot, does not make many mistakes, and I, I think the Birmingham Iron are forced to be reckoned with because they are patient as all get out, and very similar to the Patriots, if you give them a chance, they will make you pay. The second game I want to talk about, I want to talk about the Arizona Hot Shots. Barely beating the Memphis Express, they won 20 to 18. The Arizona Hotshots beat the Memphis Express 20 to 18. And I was shocked how close this game was. Uh, week one, Arizona's quarterback, John Wolford, was basically flawless. He was fantastic. In week two, he took a step back. He wasn't as good. He had, uh, he had two interceptions in the first half. But I will give John Wolford credit. He kept battling. He battled back and pulled it out, got his team into, into position, and won the game. What's notable, though, is the way Memphis's defense is played. Their, Memphis's defense is the reason why they were in the game. Memphis has a Mike Singletary, love him or hate him, I'm not a big fan, but he's a great, a wonderful defensive-minded head coach. And uh, ultimately, the offense for Memphis is what limited them. In the first two games combined, their quarterback, Christian Hackenberg, has really struggled. He's got a 50% completion percentage, which means that 10 other quarterbacks in the Alliance of American Football have a higher completion percentage than Christian Hackenberg. And, and really, if 10 guys are ahead of you in a league where there's only eight teams, you're pretty bad. And even if you adjust it for guys who started and only threw a couple passes, he's still like seventh. It's not good. Between, in two games, he has 189 yards, passing a very low number. In comparison, Logan Woodside, John Woodford, and Luis Perez all have over 400 passing yards, and Garrett Gilbert has over 600 passing yards, 620. Christian Hackenberg only has one interception, which is, is fine, but he is at the very bottom of the Alliance of American Football. He's not playing well, he's not getting good coaching, and he's going to significantly hold back the Memphis Express. Until they make a change, it's not going to work. And by the way, I watched that game. There was nobody at that stadium. The, the re, I'm worried about the Alliance America of American Football's attendance. Nobody seems to be going to those games. I'm going to a game in San Diego this weekend, and I, 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 I don't know what to expect. There are going to be like 10,000 people in a, 100, 000, a stadium built for 100,000 people. I don't, I don't know if that's going to be very off-putting or not, um, but I'm interested to see. It's also worth noting, next week, the Memphis Express play the Orlando Apollos, and it's going to be rough for them. They are going to get demolished uh, by... Orlando, who's very likely the best team in the league, and uh, it's, it's going to be ugly. Let's move on. Let's talk about the Orlando Apollos. Uh, the Orlando Apollos beat the San Antonio Commanders 37-29, to 
man, the game was awesome. It was the game was as exciting as I expected. It was really, really good. Last week I said that the Orlando Apollos had a better quarterback, but then stupidly I picked the Commanders to win the game, which is wrong. I mean, the better quarterback won this game. Garrett Gilbert, the quarterback for uh, for Orlando, was the difference in this football game. It was a tie game in the fourth quarter, and San Antonio quarterback Logan Woodside threw a really costly interception to the outside. He threw a late 10 yard out. It got picked off, returned for a touchdown. Pick six. And uh, that was ultimately what gave Orlando the win. That was the difference in the game. Orlando's ability and their, the, the ability to run the football is what really impressed me with Orlando. They, we, I had a buddy of mine who played in the NFL text me, the commanders are really good up front. Their roster's fantastic. And it didn't look like that on Saturday, on, on Sunday. It looked like they were well-matched, and Orlando really took it to them physically up front. And uh, I, I think Orlando's a force to be reckoned with. Their quarterback leads the Alliance of American Football in passing yards, Garrett Gilbert. He has 620 yards, which is almost 150 yards more than the next quarterback, Logan Woodside, who has 478. I still believe the Birmingham Iron have the best quarterback in the league, Luis Perez. But uh, Orlando is probably the most complete team. They have the second-best quarterback, Garrett Gilbert. And they will likely go 3-0 and next week after beating the Memphis Express. Now, this is the game, the last game of the weekend... It's the game I won't most want to dive into. I really want to deeply talk about this game. I'm, I'm very, it's just wildly interesting to me. The San Diego Fleet beat the Atlanta Legends 24 to 12. And again, the words I used are wildly interesting. This game was just a, if you're a football nerd, had my attention. What we got to see was a, a transformation of strategy over the course of the game for San Diego. See, early in the game, San Diego's offensive line was atrocious. They were awful, awful, awful. They were so, so bad. And what's interesting is San Diego switched quarterbacks after week one. They, they ditched Mike Bercovici for a, a newer quarterback, Philip Nelson. And I, I wrote in my notes early in the first quarter, I said, it does not matter who plays quarterback for this team. Their offensive line is awful. They are awful. And they were. San Diego could not run longer passing concepts. They had problems. Their offensive line simply could not block long enough. It was a problem. So they needed to change the play calling. The quarterback didn't have time to get to the end of his drop. What he had to do is if you get to the end of your drop, the ball has to come out now. And they were not giving their quarterbacks time to get all the way through their passing concepts and get through their reads because they physically were unable to block long enough. Now, it's... I think it's cool. I, I really like Mike Martz. Mike Martz is a San Diego Fleet's head coach. He is an offensive genius. I think he's a wonderful offensive mind. But it doesn't matter how clever or creative the play calling is if you cannot run the plays properly. The offensive line was struggling. They were doing really, really bad. And I, I felt bad for Mike Martz because I realized he doesn't have the dudes he needs to execute his offense. He's calling these wonderful play calls with, you know, uh, they, they're pulling the linemen to do pass blocks and they're putting guys in motion in really cool ways and they kept screwing it up. And it's like, ah, oh, dang it. And some of that's on the coaching with preparation. It's got to be. But some of it is just his guys physically were, they tried and they physically couldn't get into the right position. They had bad technique. His offensive linemen were not very athletic. They were getting physically dominated, and they were missing a lot of assignments. But some of that's preparation. Some of that is just guys who don't understand the game very well. And what's even worse is the one time their quarterback, Philip Nelson, had a, an open guy. He had time in the pocket. He had the ability to go all the way through his reads. He had a guy wide open, and he missed it. <laughs> he waited too long. He missed his window, threw the ball where the safety could make a play, and the safety knocked it down. All of this is to say that San Diego was awful on offense early in the game against the Atlanta Legends. So San Diego made a change. They simplified their play calling. They started running the ball a ton. And it, really fascinating to me is they had one touchdown drive late in the game. They had a rushing touchdown. And they only called one pass play the entire drive. They really, really scaled everything back. And it worked. It worked. They won the game. They won 24-12. to 12. So he, here's the main takeaway from the game between the San Diego Fleet and the Atlanta Legends. Uh, and I want to say it very, very briefly, I'm really sorry. I it's impossible to find 
the box scores from Alliance of American Football Games. You just can't. You can find like overall stats, the league leaders. You cannot find uh, who what happened from game to game. And so I cannot find the the information I wanted to to back this up. But what we learned is how important. It, I wish I could tell you how many yards they ran for, but I can't. But what we did learn was how you run the ball, your ability to run the ball is incredibly important in this league. See, many teams in the AAF have limited quarterbacks, Mike Bercovici, Philip Nelson, Matt Sims. But if you can run the ball really well, you have to rely less on your quarterback. You can have a worse quarterback, Christian Hackenberg. If you run the ball a bunch of times and use play action properly, like if I was calling plays, I, I, I so badly wish I could call plays for the Memphis Express because they have a great system and they just are not utilizing it properly. And uh, my point is this. If you can run the ball really, really well, you need less from your quarterback. And then as, as defenses have to adjust to stopping the run, more defenders have to suck down to the line of scrimmage. you got to put six or seven guys in the box, which means they're playing the run, meaning there are fewer people back to stop the pass. And it allows really good matchups downfield. And then you can even use play action, which is you fake the run and then throw the football. Or you can run screen passes, which is you suck everybody upfield, throw behind them as they're caught in a trap. I, I don't know. I, I'm Running the ball matters in this league. It really helps, gives you a huge advantage. And the Alliance of American Football is just such a fun league. I, I really think it's unique. It's very regional. And so far, after two weeks, I am loving the Alliance of American Football. Now, um, it, <laughs> I'm going to read you a horrifying story from the Alliance of American Football. So after week one of the Alliance of American Football, apparently the league was having trouble paying its employees, and its employees being players, guys who play on the football field. Apparently they were dangerously close to missing play, uh, payroll for the players. Now the problem was solved. Here's what happened. The owner of the Carolina Hurricanes, Tom Dundon, stepped in and made a $250 million investment in the Alliance of American Football. As a result, because of the money he gave, he was immediately made the chairman of the Alliance of American Football, Tom Dundon. Now, uh, th this is horrifying. This is not an encouraging story I want to hear as a fan of the Alliance of American Football. I don't care that they were saved. It's, it's really, really good. I'm, I'm very glad that the league I love was saved. But the fact that things got so close to collapsing, just, uh, I, I, it's not good. It's very scary. Living paycheck to paycheck when you're a college student makes sense. When you're a, a business, a giant organization with eight franchises and, oh man, the fact that they came dangerously close to being able to even pay their players already after one week, that puts a, a, just a severely bad taste in my mouth, one I, I just don't feel good about at all. Um, now, it's, it's worth noting, my first question when I heard, oh, $250 million. How much is that? Like, I, actually, I know it's a, lot, a ton of money, more than I'll ever have in my life. But is it actually, a lot of, is it actually enough money to help their league? Is it, is it, how far will it go? Is it enough to fill paychecks, fulfill paychecks for the entire season? Maybe. The truth is, I did my research. I have, I have no idea. And nobody seems to know. Nobody seems to understand. And maybe it's assumed it's a ton of money. Uh, I, I don't know. I did the math. And so I, this is not wrong. This is, excuse me. The math I'm about to share with you is completely wrong. But it's close. It's ballpark, I, I think. And so I want to share with you the numbers I found. So every single player in the Alliance of American Football, if every player makes $80,000, there are 50 players in every single franchise. So 80,000 times 50 is $4 million, which means that every franchise is about $4 million in salary owed to every player. And 4 million times eight is 32 million. I'll add another 3 million to that. So about it costs somewhere in the ballpark of 30 to $40 million, probably 35, 37 million dollars to pay Every single player in the Alliance of American Football for one season. Not to mention, though, bonuses, which adds to that number significantly. Plus, you got to pay the referees. You got to pay the medical staff. You got to pay coaches. You got to pay the front office employees. The point is this running a league is super, super expensive. 
And, and I, I genuinely ask, is, is $250 million a lot of money? I, I, I have no idea. I don't think so. I, I will be. I'm very honest. Look, I, I don't know. But it does scare me. So Tom Dundon, the Alliance of American Football savior, his, the savior investor, the guy who's now the new chairman of the AAF, for perspective, he paid $250 million to save the league. For one franchise, for, to buy the Carolina Hurricanes, he paid $420 million to buy the Carolina Hurricanes in January 2018. So I think my guess is, my very limited guess, look, again, a guess. I have no idea. I will not pretend I don't know any numbers. But my guess is he saw the Alliance of American Football as a relatively cheap investment. He said, maybe I'll get my money back. It's a, we have a chance to build something. But m- more importantly, I think it's clear the Alliance of American Football needs to make money. They better be a profitable business because you can't keep having guys come in and give a, a ton of money and just save the deal. You got to make money, uh, which means people need to watch on TV. They need to sell ads. They need to sell merchandise. They need to get people in the stands. I, I don't know what the most the biggest revenue source for a league is, again, I think it's television deals. You got to get people watching on television. I know that they make, I I work for sports networks. Fox Sports makes a ton of money. They pay really well. Uh, I I don't know, however, if the Alliance of American Football can create a self-sustaining business model. That's my fear. Uh, That's what scares me. This story just makes me incredibly uneasy. The fact they needed $250 million to be saved it's it mostly the reason why I'm scared is mostly because of my financial illiteracy. I don't know. I, I can't tell you what two hundred and fifty million dollars means. I can't say. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Are they still in trouble? I, I don't know. Some people are really happy. Some people are looking at the story from this perspective. They are saying, "Well, getting a ton of money from an investor shows that someone believes in the alliance. Someone has. Someone thinks this has a lot of promise." I'm not that trusting. I I don't. It's possible. But a rich businessman saw it as a cheap investment. I mean, cheap relative to other things. It's cheaper than he bought the team for. Maybe maybe he saw this as a chance to make his money back. I don't know. I feel like I'm talking about an episode of Shark Tank. Um, But I don't know. You could say he put a lot of money into the league because he believed in it. I just, you could also say he paid $250 million so he could have control over this new league and see what he can do with his new toy. Maybe that's nothing to him. I don't know. So we'll see what happens. Um, but the story that a guy had to come in and save the AAF and give them a ton of money just so that they could make payroll, I, I, I'm not pretending to know the money stuff. I, I have no idea. But it does make me very uneasy. I don't like living paycheck to paycheck. I do right now. It's not fun. I can't imagine a business doing that that's profitable. That's just... Ugh, ugh. Not a fan. You want to have a lot of capital, and I guess they do now, but they got to make capital. They need to bring in money with the product they have created, their ad revenue, their merchandise, their ticket sales. They need to become a self-sustaining business, and right now, looks it sounds like they're not. I don't know. I mean, look, they just started. There's time, but I don't know. I, I, I don't see anybody in the stands, and I don't know if that matters, but it seems to matter, so who knows? All right, guys, uh, that's the entire show. I really appreciate you listening. I will say uh, the topics for Friday, the things we're going to talk about on Friday, I do, look, I I plan to get my butt going, get it in gear, and turn around the show very quickly. The topics for Friday include Todd Gurley. He was hurt, apparently. We'll talk about Le'Veon Bell, who's now free of the Pittsburgh Steelers. We'll talk about Antonio Brown, who is now going to be traded. he He met with the owners, and they've decided Antonio Brown... It's best for everybody if we trade him away. We'll talk about the Alliance of American Football Week 3. We're coming up on Week 3 this weekend. I'm going to go to a game in San Diego. It's going to be really fun. I have a story about skateboarding, which I know you guys probably have never— In fact, I know for a—I know I have never talked about skateboarding on this podcast. Uh, Secretly, it's my my second favorite sport. It's football and skateboarding, my two things I love. Um, I just (laughs) never—no one else cares. I'm just going to do it at the end because I love it. And then we'll also do a Jimmy Garoppolo film breakdown. I've got it almost done. And I will finally, finally get it out and share uh, the, the struggles that Jimmy Garoppolo had last season. Guys, thank you so much. I really appreciate you. And I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful week. Remember, please help me grow by telling your friends about 
this show. But um bum bam, we are done. Bye.